Hi there, this is Robin from 8-Bit Show and Tell, and I've been getting a lot of requests to do a bit of a programming tutorial. We're going to do some 6510, which is the same as 6502 assembly language, and we're going to be using a program called Turbo Macro Pro, which is released by the demo group Style, and the latest version is from 2006. I've copied it just, in fact, the same uh, disc that I was using last time with that, that scungy thing. Anyway, on the back side of it, I used my Zoom floppy to copy a D64. I downloaded it from style64.org. I'll put a link to it down in the description. And it's an assembler. It's got a, a history to it. It was originally, I think, released by a company from Germany, and it kind of be modified. Turbo Assembler and then Turbo Macro Pro is a more advanced version of the same assembler, which has been modified. I think it's gone through several different programmers. And Elwix of Style, who's a friend of mine, did a lot of the work on this this final version here. And I'm just going to be using my uh, Commodore 128D. You can use a Commodore 64 or a 128, but if you're only using a C64, I really recommend that you get some sort of cartridge or modification to add a reset to your computer. When you're programming assembly language, if you don't have a reset switch, if you get a crash, you are not going to be able to recover your code for sure. Now, if you get a bad enough crash, you may lose your source code or or your work anyway, so you should save regularly. But if you have a reset button, that will allow the computer to reset and you get control of it again, back to basic, but most of memory will still be intact. And that allows you to often pick up from where you left off. So it's just a huge advantage, uh, particularly when you're programming assembly language. And I want to say I'm programming on the real hardware, partly just because it's, it's fun. That's how I did it back in the day. If you want to use a cross assembler, uh, that's totally fine. If you want to program on your PC or Mac or Linux on your modern computer and test an emulator, you're welcome to do that. And some of what I'm talking about here today will apply. Uh, I'm going to use this real assembler on real hardware. That's what I do on my channel here is uh, as often as possible use real hardware. Plus, you can use the same assembler in a emulator. So you can use it on the PC. Or, and you can use it on C64 Mini, for that matter, if you have one of those. So that's why I'm using this assembler. So really, you just need any Commodore computer, the Turbo Macro Pro assembler, which sits on a single floppy disk, and you really should have a reset switch. If you have a utility cartridge, like the Super Snapshot that uh, I prefer, or an Action Replay, uh, or any other cartridge, that, that's fine. So yeah, right now I've got the assembler here, so I'm just going to do a disk directory. And I'll show you all the different files that are on this disk. We're only going to be using one of them today. We'll scroll through here. These are all just different versions of Turbo Macro Pro, depending on your configuration. And uh, my normal favorite one is up here, Turbo Macro Pro plus REU, which is for the RAM expansion unit. If you have one of these, this is really the version to use. If you have a RAM expansion unit, uh, you can enable that in Vice or if you have an Ultimate 64, or even a Ultimate 1541. I don't own any of those, but I have the real RAM expansion unit, as I uh, showed you in a previous episode. I may deal with this more in a future episode, but for today we're just going to be using the plain Turbo Macro Pro, which doesn't require any extra hardware. It has some drawbacks, but that's not going to matter for what we're going to be dealing with today. I'll load it the proper way in case you don't have a cartridge wedge you can use a percent sign on on Super Snapshot to load this quickly. I'm going to load it with the traditional COM8, COM1. Okay, and once it's loaded, you just do a SYS32768. Or as the instruction books say, 8 times 4096 in case you find that easier to remember. Uh, I don't, but... Oh, and the one other thing you're going to want, on the style64.org website, there are a bunch of different command instructions. This assembler doesn't devote much memory to user-friendliness or on-screen prompts, so you really are going to want that instruction sheet when you're using this on your own. So here we are in the Turbo Macro Pro editor, and you can just freely move around, uh, kind of turbo mode. And down here at the bottom, 
Uh, there's the name. This is version 1.2 from 2006 by style. Now, down that bottom right corner, normally the amount of expanded RAM you have would be displayed there. But in this version, that is not an option. So they're just cute and put style down the corner. Shows you that saving to device 8, just down below here. I can't move the cursor down to that area. So that's why I'm, I'm hovering above it here. This is your insert mode. If you want to insert lines or type over, if you hold shift and insert, you can toggle the character insert mode. If you hit the back arrow first, you can toggle the line insert mode on or off. If you hit back arrow, which is kind of like an escape, we'll be using that a lot. If you're a VI user, that's kind of similar. If you hit the back arrow, the cursor disappears and then hold down shift to get that insert and you see that that insert line is turned on or off there i'll turn it back on down here it's showing you where the bottom of memory is that's where your source code is going to be stored the assembler itself lives at 8000 hex that's why we typed sys 8 times 4096 4096 decimal is the same as 1000 hexadecimal so 8,000 is 8 times 4,096, or 32,768. Everything above that, starting from 8,000 going upwards to 9 and 8,000 and so on, is where the, the program, the assembler, lives. And your source code starts at about 8,000 and works its way down towards 7 and 6,000. And then the space below that is what you have left over for your actual program. Now that's what the REU version, it solves that problem by using the expanded memory to swap out the assembler and your source code into the expansion memory, leaving all 64K for you to test your programs with. And then it very quickly switches back. So that, that's why that REU version is far preferred but we're not going to get into anything so serious today that that really matters. As a beginner, it doesn't really matter that much. And then of course, down here in the bottom left corner is your current X, which is also known as your column and your line. So you can move around with the cursor keys like a normal Commodore program. So I'll move up to the top. We're going to write a very simple program here. The first thing you have to do is tell the assembler where you want to assemble to and in a lot, not all, but many assemblers, star indicates where in memory you want your program to assemble to. Now, when you're coding in BASIC, you don't worry about any of these details. With assembly language, you have complete control, so it's up to you to decide with the, the limited memory you have, where is everything going to go? Where is your code going to go? Where are your sprites or your character, font, your fonts, or any other data you have? So star equals, it's the origin, and I'm going to set that to 1000 and hit return. You have limited RAM right now. For the sake of what we're doing today, we're just going to assemble low in memory, 1000. Uh, you could also use decimal if you wished, 4096, for example. But we'll, we'll call it hex today. Now this is an extremely simple program we're going to do. Turbo Macro Pro does all your formatting for you. I'm going to start typing a label here, loop one, and all a label is, is an address in memory where you're not sure what address that is. Well, of course, <laughs> I guess we do know because it's 1000, but Normally when you're programming, you may not know, like if you used another further down the program, you put loop two or, or whatever. It's a placeholder. It means this location in memory, even if I don't know for sure what the address is. A label is a place that you can jump to, like a go to in basic, or it could be where you're storing some data and you want to be able to refer to it. And then we're just going to do a single command here. Inc is the opcode, I-N-C. And what we're going to increase is D020, location D020. This opcode, INC, increases whatever follows it. So it's memory address D020. The dollar sign indicates that's hexadecimal. 
If you're a basic programmer, a Commodore 64 basic programmer, you may better know that as location 53280. It's the color of the border surrounding the screen. So again, you can use either base in this, but I'll stick with the DO20. And so that's just going to increase the number that's in the border, the border color. So we'll go from zero, for example, black, to one, which is white. And then if you increase it again, it goes to red, cyan, purple, green, blue, yellow, and so on through all 16 colors. And then it'll actually wrap around infinitely. Every location in Commerce 64 memory is an 8-bit number. And if you increase it all the way up to 255 or FF in hex, it'll just wrap around again to zero. Unlike in languages where you have actual proper variables, well, it depends on the type of variable. I think in a previous episode we showed how even basic float numbers do have a limit, way up huge exponents. But in assembly language in 6502, you're just dealing with 8-bit values as a maximum. So we'll just increase that, and then we'll do a simple jump to loop 1. And the JMP opcode, all that does is jumps, is it sends program control. There's a program counter in the 6510, and it just sets it to that new value, which means it'll go back here. It's just like a go-to in BASIC. So this is an endless loop of increase D020, and then jump back to loop one. And so these two lines of code execute over and over again. Okay, and to assemble, we hit that back arrow key, which is like the escape, and then we press three. Again, that's why you're going to want your instruction sheet. And there it very quickly assembles, and it tells you here on the screen the end of pass one. It's a two-pass assembler. That matters because when you're using those labels, sometimes it's difficult to resolve it all in a single pass. The assembler, sometimes if you're referring to a memory location ahead or behind, and the assembler hasn't yet come up with a, an actual address for that label, it's still just an unknown. A two-pass assembler is a lot better because it can handle those forward and backward references. And you can see that it has assembled from location 1000, which we told it to, to 1005, so that's a total of six bytes of code, a very short little program. Actually, we can look at that. Uh, there's no errors. We're going to pop into my Super Snapshot Monitor, which I've used before. Just press the button on my cartridge, press the M key to shortcut into the monitor, and we're going to disassemble at 1000. Just so you can see the code that was generated. And there it is. As simple as that. Increase DO20. It's at memory location 1000. And then over here, jump back to 1000. So here on the left, it's just telling you what address we're viewing. And then the three bytes are EE, which corresponds to INC. Just going to hit R. Here's the program counter, the status register, the accumulator, the X register, the Y register, and the stack pointer. Program counter quickly is a 16-bit address in Commerce 64 memory. That's 64K is 16 bits, and that's the current location that the CPU is executing code. The status register, this is what allows you to make decisions. It's actually split up into several bits, such as the zero flag, whether the last operation resulted in a zero or not, minus or negative flag, if the last result had its high bit set, the carry, which indicates that the last addition or subtraction caused the carry bit to change. And this is important when you're trying to do 16-bit operations on an 8-bit processor, for example, the accumulator. And we primarily use it for adding, subtracting, uh, and doing logical operations, bit operations. The X and the Y register, they're typically used for addressing a range of memory or for counting down or up in a loop. They have other uses, but that's the, the main uses for them. 
And then the stack pointer, there's a processor stack, a first in, first out stack where you can temporarily store information. So you can use that as a programmer, but the processor itself uses it when you do a jump to subroutine, which is like a go sub. It uses that to store the previous program counter value so it can actually return from that and continue executing the code. Okay, back to what I was talking about. These are the two lines of code that we assembled. They're here in memory at 1000. EE is the op code. Over on the right here, it's just interpreting. When it sees an EE, it knows that is an increment opcode, that it's incrementing a 16-bit address, the contents of this 16-bit address. So at locations D020, that's in the VIC2 chip, it's the border color. And you can see here it's represented in low byte, high byte format. So we would call this D020, but you see the order is reversed and the 6502 just does this. The low byte is first, and then the high byte. And then 4C on the next line is the jump opcode. And then the following two bytes are where it's going to jump to. And again, it's low byte, high byte format. So that's 1000, zero, 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 and that sends it back here again. Every opcode gets turned into one, two, or three byte sequence. Both of these ones are three byte sequence where there's an opcode and then two bytes worth of parameter after. Sometimes there's only one byte of parameter. Sometimes there's no parameter and it's just the opcode on its own. Okay, but we're going to resume. Here's, we're back in the assembler. We're finally going to run this program. S to start it. And there it is. The border is flashing away. So the computer is so rapidly flashing the border that it looks more like a series of lines. And so what's actually happening is that as the screen is being drawn from the top left to the bottom right, that takes oh, approximately 16,000 cycles to draw the Commodore 64 and, well, and 128, the C64 mode that we're in, runs at about 1 megahertz. So that's 1 million cycles per second screen on this NTSC model is being updated 60 times a second. So you divide a million by 60 and you get somewhere around 16.6 thousand cycles per frame. And then each of those instructions takes some number of cycles. We can actually look that up. You know what? Something I didn't mention at the beginning, something you're really going to want is a book. If you're, if you could only have one book, this is the one Commodore 64 programmers reference guide. A fantastic reference and if you can only have one get this and if you can't find a copy a physical copy of the book or you don't like you know you don't like paper books anymore uh, you can download a copy now this little badge I've been showing here I don't know if I've mentioned yet Commodore Security this was given to me by, by my friend DLH who I see uh, down in Chicago every year and he has an amazing website called Bombjack. I'll put a URL down below and he scans uh, Commodore manuals and puts them up there as PDFs. So he's fantastic. You can download this and so many other books from his website. Just if you do make use of it, send him a, a PayPal tip or, and please don't abuse his server. I think some people go on there and try to download every book, but he's, he's paying for that out of his own pocket. So DLH, awesome guy. You know, tell him I sent you. So here in the programmer's reference guide, and here's the chart he's looking for page 254, all the different opcodes down the side and all the different addressing modes along the top. Yeah, and that's well, two pages. But anyway, what I'm looking for here is ink. And we'll go over here. And if you ink an absolute address, you just follow doo -doo -doo, six cycles for the ink, do 2 and then jump takes three cycles right down below it. So that's nine cycles. So what I was getting to was if you take that 16,000 some odd, divide it by nine, you're changing the color, uh, whatever, seven to 16, 17, 1800 times per frame. So that's what we're witnessing right now with this crazy display in the borders. 
And now to get out of here, it's an endless loop. And you can't press stop or anything to get out of it. But what you can do is if you just hit stop restore, that'll break out of it. And then you can type in S, YS32768 or 8 times 4096. And you're right back in your program again. That's what's fantastic about this particular assembler and even better in the RAM expansion unit version. Okay, so we'll just, let's do one more thing here. Uh, there's a corresponding command decrement, DEC, and we're going to decrease DO21, which is the same as 53281 decimal, which is the color of the main screen. Okay, and we're going to just back arrow three to assemble it. You see the size has gone up another three bytes, the size of the program, and we're going to start. And sorry about this, I hope nobody's uh, affected. Now we're increasing and decreasing, and it's a real chaotic mess, so I'll stop that. Sorry if that was difficult to look at. And again, we'll go back into the program. That's already been a pretty long session. I think we'll call it there. I think I hope that was a good introduction to Turbo Macro Pro. We wrote a very quick program that does something. Uh, something maybe really irritating and annoying, but maybe kind of cool too. I'm going to try and focus on little programs if I keep doing more like this. On fairly short programs that do something each time. And one other comment, if there was only one other book I could have besides the Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide. It would be this one here, Mapping the Commodore 64. This is a slightly later edition than the 64C. And really the two machines are basically identical, except the 64C would ship with GEOS. The uh, graphical operating system, which is covered at least partly in this book as well. But it's really not necessary. If you just find the original Mapping the Commodore 64, uh, that should be... Uh, totally adequate. Again, uh, this book should be available for downloading if you prefer that, but uh, I really do myself like having physical copies of these books. These aren't the only two good books, but if I could only have two, these would be the ones. Okay, thanks a lot for watching, and if you haven't subscribed, please do and hit that little bell notification icon. If you enjoyed this, let me know, and if you, if you didn't, that's fine, let me know too. Like I was saying, quite a few people were asking me to do some sort of beginner's tutorial uh, or some sort of walkthrough. So that's why I attempted to do here. <laughs> if I miss the mark, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll try to do a better job next time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.